Happy New Year! Welcome to Reading for Royalty with the Saskatoon Public Library and Drag Story Hour with Storyteller Phoenix and Storyteller Stabby the Unicorn. Hi! We are so excited to be reading with you today. We've got two fantastic stories as well as a body break, so we should probably jump right into it. What Absolutely. story do you have today, Therese? I have And Tango Makes Three. Aww, mm -hmm. what a lovely little tale. And I have Kahasi and the Loon, which is an Inuit legend. Ooh. So those are our two stories today. Nice. Are you going to be reading first? Sure. All right. Thanks. Uh, and Tango Makes Three by Justin Richardson and Peter Parnell, illustrated by Henry Cole. And it's published by Simon and Schuster Books for Young Readers. In the middle of New York City, there is a great big park called Central Park. Children love to play there. It has a toy boat pond where they can sail their boats. It has a carousel to ride on in the summer and an ice rink to skate on in the winter. Best of all, it has its very own zoo. Every day, families of all kinds go to visit the animals that live there. Ooh. But children and their parents aren't the only families at the zoo. The animals make families of their own. There are red panda bear families with mothers and fathers and furry red panda bear cubs. There are monkey dads and monkey moms raising noisy monkey babies. There are toad families and toucan families and cotton top tamarind families too. Ooh, exotic. And in the penguin house, there are penguin families. Every year at the very same time, the girl penguins start noticing the boy penguins and the boy penguins start noticing the girls. When the gir right girl and the right boy find each other, they become a couple. Two penguins in the penguin house were a little bit different. One was named Roy and the other one was named Silo. Roy and Silo were both boys, but they did everything together. They bowed to each other, they walked together, they sang to each other, and swam together. Wherever Roy went, Silo went too. Aww. They didn't spend much time with the girl penguins, and the girl penguins didn't spend much time with them. Instead, Roy and Silo wound their necks around each other. Their keeper, Mr. Gramsci, noticed the two penguins and thought to himself, they must be in love. Roy and Silo watched how the other penguins made a home, so they built a nest of stones for themselves. Every night, Roy and Silo slept there together, just like the other penguin couples. Aww. And every morning, Roy and Silo woke up together. But one day, Roy and Silo saw that the other couples could do something they could not. The mama penguin would lay an egg. She and the papa penguin would take turns keeping the egg warm until finally it would hatch. And then there would be a baby penguin. Oh, baby penguins are cute and fluffy. Look how tiny they are. Woo. They don't have like the tuxedo look though. They're all gray. I don't know. They have to, they have to earn their tuxedo, I guess. I don't know. Roy and Silo had no egg to sit on and keep warm. They had no baby chick to feed and cuddle and love. Their nest was nice, but it was empty. One day, Roy found something that looked like what the other penguins were hatching and he brought it to their nest. It was only a rock, but Silo carefully sat on it and sat and sat. When Silo got sleepy, he slept, and when Silo was done sleeping and sitting, he swam. And Roy sat. Day after day, Silo and Roy sat on a rock. But nothing happened, because it's a rock, it's not an egg. Then Mr. Gamzee got an idea. He found an egg that needed to be cared for, and he brought it to Roy and Silo's nest. Roy and Silo knew just what to do. They moved the egg to the center of their nest. Every day they turned it, so each side stayed warm. Some days Roy sat with Silo while Silo went for food. Other days it was Silo's turn to take care of their egg. They sat in the morning, and they sat at night. They sat through lunchtime, and swam time, and supper. They sat at the beginning of the month, and they sat at the end of the month, and they sat all of the days in between. That's a lot of sitting. Until one day they heard a sound coming from inside the egg. Beep, 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 beep. It said, Roy and Silo called back. Swap, swap. Beep, beep. That's the egg. Oh, a nut crack. And it's getting bigger and bigger. And now there's a hole. And the hole is getting bigger. Until suddenly a tiny hole appeared in the eggshell. And then, oh, crack. Out came their very own baby. 
see. She had fuzzy white feathers and a funny black beak. Now Roy and Silo were fathers. We'll call her Tango, said Mr. Gamsey, decided, because it takes two to make a tango. <laughs> Roy and Silo taught Tango how to sing for them when she was hungry. They fed her food from their beaks. They snuggled her in their nest at night, and Tango was the very first penguin in the zoo to have two daddies. Oh, look at all the penguins. Soon Tango grew strong enough to leave the nest. Roy and Silo took her for a swim, just like all the other penguin families. And all of the children who came to the zoo could see Tango and her two fathers playing in the penguin house with the other penguins. Hooray, Roy! Hooray, Silo! Welcome, Tango! They cheered. That looks like a good time. At night, the three penguins returned to their nest. They snuggled together, and like all the other penguins in the penguin house, and all other animals in the zoo, and all families in the big city and around them, they went to sleep. Thank you so much. That was so much fun. Wasn't that a lot of fun? What a lovely way to look at families. Mm -hmm. All different kinds, hey? Yeah, so even, many different kinds. Even in the penguin world. I, I think I'd, I'd like to do a tango now. Oh? Maybe a little bit of a tango. Maybe a different sort of tango. Do you know what we do on New Year's Eve? We count down. Oh. We count down from ten. Maybe we can do some sort of... Tango's a dance. Did you know that? Yes, I did. Yeah, tango's a type of dance. So maybe we could do some sort of a dance. What kind of moves are in a dance? Arm moves, leg Arm moves. Leg moves. Sometimes a head bob. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to stand up. All right. Now we're all stood up. Thank you. So let's start at 10. Let's do 10 jumps to get us started. Ready? We're going to count down from 10, just like we do on New Year's. Maybe I need to take my glasses off first. There we go. All right. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What number comes next? Did you say nine? Let's do nine arm circles. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, good job so far. Eight, eight. What could we do eight of? I know Stabby suggested we do head bops. Let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Awesome. Seven. What can we do for seven? Let's do jumping jacks. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, I'm definitely starting to feel like I'm doing some sort of a dance, body movement. Now we're down to six. What could we do for six? How about six spins? Like a dreidel, if any of you have ever heard of Hanukkah. So we can put our hands up over our heads and we can be dreidel spinning tops. One, two, three, four, five, six. Halfway there, halfway there. Can we run? We're running to the end. Can we run on the spot? Five, ready? One, two, three, four, five. Oh my goodness, we're almost there. Four more to go until we get to zero. What about frog jumps? Can we do frog jumps? All right, you're not gonna see me when I go down, but I'm gonna squish up really small and then you're gonna see me when I pop back up again. Ready? One, two, three, four. Oh goodness. Three more things, three more things. What if we do a frog jump and then we do a spin and then we do a, um, a jumping jack? Can we do all those as we count? Three, two, one, ready? Let's go. Three, two, one. Good job, everyone. We counted down all the way from 10 to one. Are you ready for the next book? Mm -hmm. All right. See you there. Whew. Did you enjoy that body break? I sure enjoyed that body break. Got my blood pumping. All right. This book is an Inuit legend. It's Kahasi and the Loon. Now, did you know this time of year when the sun is starting to get brighter and brighter after the winter solstice, it's a good time for First Nations and other Indigenous peoples to be able to tell their legends because a lot of the creatures, a lot of the spirits, a lot of the animals in these legends are sleeping. So it's a good time to reflect and to think about where they came from and oral tradition and legends are a very big part of that. So this is Kahasi and the Loon. It is written and adapted by Terry Cochrane, illustrated by Charles Reasoner. 
and it is published by the Rourke Corporation, Inc. Kahasi and the Loon. In the land of the frozen north, there lived an Inuit boy named Kahasi. He lived with his mother in a small hunting village near the sea. Every day, all day long, Kahasi slept on a warm caribou hide near the lamp in his igloo. Why do you not play with other children? His mother would ask. You should be learning how to hunt and fish so you will grow to be a good man. But Kahasi never answered. He stayed asleep by the lamp day after day and no one could wake him. One morning, before the sun was up, Kahasi heard a faint rustling sound and felt a feather-like touch on his cheek. What was this? He thought. Who disturbs my sleep? He blinked his eyes open to see a beautiful black bird with white speckles on its back. Who are you? Asked Kahasi. Hush, whispered the bird. It is I, the loon. I bring a message from your grandfather. Come. Quietly, so he would not waken his mother, Kahasi dressed and followed the loon. But I do not know my grandfather, he whispered to the bird. He has been gone since my mother was a young girl. This is true, answered the loon, but you will meet him one day. Then he will explain. Oh, I love a bit of a mystery. Together, they went a great distance from the village until they came upon a flowering shrub. Kahasi had never seen such a plant before. You must come here every day, said the loon, and eat four leaves of this magical bush. Then you will bathe in the waters of this stream. You must be strong when your grandfather calls for you. Kahasi did not understand, but he ate four of the bitter leaves and bathed in the icy waters. Each day after that, the loon woke him and went with him to the magical place. Then, before he was missed, the boy would return to his warm bed by the lamp. He is a lazy one, people would say to Kahasi's mother. What good is he to you or our village? He does not hunt or fish or even help you repair your igloo. But Kahasi's mother would always answer, He is a good son. He does not find trouble. He will learn to be a man someday, an important man. You will see. One day they followed the next until there came a season of hunger in the village. Time after time, the hunters returned empty-handed. All the animals seemed to be hiding. What were the people to do? Kahasi woke to see the loon sitting beside him. Why have you come, loon? he asked. Your people are starving, the loon answered. You must help them. Kahasi immediately went out to see what he could do. When he found the hunters gathered in the village, they all pointed and stared at him. So you finally woke up, someone shouted. What is it, lazy one? Are you hungry? Do you miss your food your mother always catches for you? I will help you, Kahasi said. The men laughed. You! That is impossible. How can you do what our best hunters cannot? Kahasi held up a big walrus skin. Each of you take hold around this, he said. I will stand on it, and then you can throw me into the air. When I am high enough, I will be able to see where the animals are hiding. The villagers had never before heard of such a thing, but the rumbling in their stomachs told them to try. Kahasi bounced higher and higher into the air until he shouted, There! I see a herd of walruses on an ice floe! Quickly, the hunters grabbed their harpoons and tied the dogs to the sledges. Kahasi rode with the leader as they raced in the direction of the walruses. Soon they turned the sledges over and anchored them in the snow. Then they pushed their umiak into the water. Kahasi sat silently at the bow. You helped us find the walruses, said a hunter, but surely you do not think you can hunt. 
Tallahassee said nothing. Let him stay, the leader said. He may learn something. They padded through the rough waters to the ice floe. Each time they drew near enough to throw a harpoon, a giant wave pushed them back and the weapon missed its mark. Finally, the men were exhausted and they decided to turn back. Kahasi stood up. Paddle closer once more, he said. I know what to do. The hunters murmured in disbelief, but did as he asked. When they drew close, a powerful wave lifted the umiak high into the air and Kahasi jumped from the boat onto the ice floe. Before the startled walruses had time to attack or dive into the sea, the boy, the boy began knocking their heads together. Then he picked up the stunned animals and hurled them back one by one to the waiting umiak. When it could hold no more, Kahasi jumped back into the boat. The hunters couldn't believe what happened. It took many men to drag a walrus. How could a boy do such a thing as this? When they returned to their village, there was much rejoicing. The people wanted to thank Kahasi, but he was nowhere to be seen. His mother finally found him, curled up, asleep by the lamp. Days passed and Kahasi still slept by the fire, waking only to go secretly with the loon each morning to their special place. The people soon forgot how he had saved them from hunger. They remembered only his laziness. One day, strangers came to the village, bringing with them a fierce giant. Who among you can defeat our champion? called one of the strangers. Or are you all too weak? The giant was twice the size of the strongest man in the village, but it would cast shame on their people to refuse such a challenge. There was nothing else to be done. One by one, the men took their turn to fight. Kahasi woke to see the loon sitting beside him in the sunlight. Why have you come, loon? he asked. Your people are threatened by a fierce giant, the loon said. You must help them. Kahasi immediately went out to see what the trouble was. He reached the circle of shouting people just as a giant tossed the last hunter aside like a mosquito. Kahasi stepped forward. You have not yet challenged me. The giant looked down. Ha! Now you send a boy to fight. I will throw him away like an old bone. With that, he reached out and grabbed Kahasi's arms, but he could not move him. The giant tried again and again, but it was as though Kahasi were anchored to the ground. The boy reached out and with one hand picked the giant up and tossed him beyond the last igloo in the village. The people cheered and the strangers hurried to carry their champion off in shame. The people tried to thank their hero, but he was gone. Again, his mother found him asleep in his favorite place by the lamp. Soon afterward, harder times yet fell on the people. With great shaking of the earth, the mountains began moving toward the sea. Closer and closer they came until they reached the edge of the village. Kahasi, the people shouted, wake up, wake up, you must save us. But Kahasi slept on and the people took anything they could carry and pulled their umiaks and kayaks to the shore. Just then the loon swooped over their heads to Kahasi's igloo. Kahasi awoke to feel the earth trembling. What is this loon, he asked. It is the mountains, answered the loon. They are attacking your people. You must help. When Kahasi crawled out of his igloo, the villagers were pushing their boats into the water. Wait, called the boy. I will stop this terrible thing. With that, he hurried past all the igloos that now lined the shore. He held up his hands, shouting, Go back! Go back where you belong! My grandfather would have it so! But the mountains continued their march to the sea. Come, Kahasi, save yourself, the people called. Kahasi ignored them and laid his hands against the biggest mountain. With all his strength, he pushed harder and harder until finally it was back where it belonged. Then he pushed another mountain and another until they were all in their places. After this, he took a giant piece of driftwood from the beach and dredged a space between the mountain and the village all the way to the sea. This became a river which the mountains could never cross.
As the people sang with joy, the loon came to Kahasti and said, You have done well. Your grandfather, he who holds up the earth, needs you. He is old and becomes weak. He bids you hurry. Unseen by the villagers, Kahasti got into his kayak and paddled after the loon. When they were far from shore, a giant whirlpool caught the small boat, swirling it fiercely. With all his strength, Kahasi could not free himself. Do not worry, calmed the loon. It is but the way to your grandfather. At last, Kahasi understood. He dropped his paddle and allowed the sea to swallow him. When the people searched for Kahasi, he was nowhere to be seen. His mother looked for him by the fire, but he was not there. Where is my son? She called. But before anyone could answer, the loon landed beside her. Do not worry, he said. Kahasi is safe. He has gone to be with his grandfather. As the loon explained, the villagers understood how important Kahasi really was. In all the days that followed, the people sang of his deeds. And each time they felt the earth tremble, they knew it was only Kahasi, the strong one, shifting the earth from one shoulder to the other. Thank you so much, Sabi, for reading with us today. Absolutely, my pleasure. And thank you to all of you. So from Storyteller Phoenix and Storyteller Stabby the Unicorn, we say goodbye. Thank you for joining Saskatoon Public Library's Reading with Royalty and Drag Story Hour Canada. Happy New Year!